Good evening, and welcome to my living room and to this benefit concert for Artist Relief Treaty. Uh, over the next 90 minutes, I'm going to play some of the music that I love most. And it really is this music that has been my emotional sustenance these last two very difficult months. Uh, I am giving this concert because I am genuinely so very worried about my many, many artist friends and colleagues who, for as long as this crisis is going on, they have no source of income. And even in the best of times, uh, they live from concert to concert. And therefore, I am trying to do my small part to ensure that they can remain artists that they can be doing what they do uh, after this crisis is over uh, because I know that our society would be just infinitely poorer without them and without the contribution they make. I will be actually speaking to some of my artist friends and colleagues in uh, some of the breaks between pieces, so I don't want to talk much more right now. Uh, we'll get straight to music matter at hand, but I just want to sort of make two brief announcements. The first is, in addition to nearly $10,000 in pledged donations that have already been given for this concert, uh, thanks to two very generous donors, there is $7,500 uh, in matching grants. So I hope that might inspire you to be as generous as you are able to tonight. And the other thing is that if in filling out the donation form, if you, under special comments, just enter my last name. If you give $100, uh, you will receive a signed CD from me. And if you give $500, I will uh, join you on a Zoom call. Or if you prefer, you can not enter my name and give $500 and I will leave you alone. It's whatever you prefer. Um, but at any rate, I again thank you for your generosity and for um, joining me in sharing this beautiful music, uh, even if for now it has to be from a distance.
I'm so happy to be virtually here with the Izuri Quartet, my old friends, except for Emma, who's the new friend. She's a new member of the quartet. Um, it's wonderful to see all of your faces. And uh, I thought maybe to start, if one of you could maybe just talk a little bit about the quartet and about, about the activities that you guys have collectively and individually. Sure, I can start. Um, my name is Miho, and so together with Emma and Ayane and Karen, we're the Izuri Quartet based in New York City. Um, and we, you know, came together as a quartet seven years ago because it was something that we've always wanted to do and dreamt about, um, and we love the string quartet world. Um, and we also have this really interesting model that really feeds into our all of our creative um, sides where in addition to having the quartet as a central pillar in our lives, we each participate and play in different ensembles, uh, like the Orpheus Chamber Orchestra and the Silk Road Ensemble. Um, Ayane has a duo called Ayane and Paul. And um, we all also love um, teaching and that's been a really, really powerful and important part of our lives too. Yeah, I mean, I think playing in a quartet is, is just about the most beautiful labor of love for a musician and all of these freelance activities which are are so vital to the, our culture are, you know, a little bit precarious at the best of times. You, you never know what the future will hold. But now um, with COVID, I would assume all activities are totally on hold. How are you managing that? Are there any sources of income beyond the bits of teaching that you do throughout this time? Right, so right now concert playing is totally on hold um, and in the meantime, it's sort of been a moment for the whole field to explore technology. And we've been, you know, putting together videos, performances, materials to be shared online. Of course, this isn't a totally sustainable source of income for anyone at the moment. There are some fundraisers that are organized by presenters, but really this is something that artists are donating their time for right now um, in general. And in terms of just when we can get back to live performance, um, we're in a bit of a holding pattern. Um, in some cases, um, devising contingency plans with presenters holding multiple dates for next season, um, just kind of waiting to see what happens. Yeah, and then hoping that the contingency plans don't also fall through because of the virus, I understand that well. Are, are you, I mean, because you're, you guys uh, are in a community of people who are living this life at this uncertainty. I'm curious to know if you've heard any particular stories from friends and colleagues about, about hardships or just, uh, or whether you have some of the experiences of your own that have been particularly poignant that you would want to share. Sure, yeah. I, I think this time has really forced us all to dig deep and figure out what making music means to us on a really personal level. Um, and how making music nourishes us um, so that we can be able to donate our time to these efforts without having the guaranteed income coming back yeah. in. Yeah, I know, which is, is, is a very noble way of thinking about the situation, which is obviously because you have plenty of insecurity in your lives yourselves. It's the generosity of that is beautiful. Ayana, I wonder if you have any particular experiences that have been striking to you. Yeah, um, I think it's been really telling and interesting how all of my friends have reacted in different ways to the pandemic. And, you know, some people feel like they really need to share their music online, which is really great. Um, and then other people, I think, are really going through a grieving stage. I have some friends who like can barely get out of bed, um, knowing that like they can't make music in the way that they feel really passionate about. So hopefully, like through all of this, like we can like the the thing that we take away in the end is like everybody has a little bit more room for empathy, whatever that kind of spectrum means to them. Yeah, that I mean, that's very beautiful, and it's. It's heartbreaking also to hear, because I think about it, I, I'm so grateful that however much I may be missing right now, I'm a pianist, I can make a lot of music on my own, but for people whose lives are based in chamber music and a chamber orchestra, it's the impossibility of doing that right now is leaves a void so enormous. And I think we all feel like, what would we be without music? And, and I 
just that's why I think finding ways to support musicians through this crisis is so unbelievably important. So I, I, I thank you for being the beautiful musicians that you are, for the beautiful experiences we've had playing together, and, and also so much for agreeing to, to talk to me today. And I really so hope to see you and play music with you soon again. Thanks so much.
Hi, I'm here here with uh, Molly Carr and Andrew Jans. We've all known each other for uh, a long time, but uh, to start, why don't you guys uh, introduce yourselves to everybody who's watching? Sure. So I'm, <laughs> I'm Molly Carr. I play the viola. I teach on faculty at the Juilliard School in their pre-college division and on faculty at Bard College Conservatory of Music. And I'm also the founder and co-director together with Andrew Jantz of the nonprofit Project Music Heals Us. And my name is Andrew Jans, and I uh, met Jonathan at the Marlboro Music Festival and I met Molly uh, her freshman year at the Manhattan School of Music um, and we've been friends ever since. So um, it's really nice to be here with you guys. Yes, yeah, one of the only fringe benefits of this time is I, I see people who I haven't seen in ages and ages, even if it's virtually. 
Um, so I, I really wanted to talk to you because I, like a lot of people, I saw the article uh, about music that heals us in the New York Times, and I was, I was really moved by it. Uh, it, it had a kind of a profound effect on me as a rap. I think it'll be more powerful if you guys talk about uh, the project itself and how you decided to found it than if I do, so. Sure, yeah, Project Music, Project Music Heals Us um, is a nonprofit which has been in existence for the past seven years. Um, I founded it in 2014 um, in order to bring music into communities and facilities that otherwise wouldn't have access to the arts. So over the past six seasons, that has meant over 300 free concerts and workshops in facilities like um, prisons. We do a lot of work in prisons, in homeless shelters, in refugee camps, in hospitals, hospices, nursing homes, and um, Otherwise, like I said, any community that otherwise has a harder time seeing a classical concert. Um, and so then when, when COVID hit, um, we found ourselves in a position of just trying to figure out how we would continue to um, serve the people that we serve. And um, we're searching for ways to move online just like all the other organizations today that. Um, try and still do our concerts virtually. So we started reaching out to nursing homes and um, in the prisons and retirement homes to see what would be possible. And in the middle of this, actually, I'm gonna hand it over to Andrew because um, this was the, the miracle moment that he actually was um, the start of this new programming for COVID patients in hospitals. Sure, I, I actually went to Manhattan School of Music with a, a woman named Rachel Easterwood. She was a clarinetist at the time studying with Charles Nydick. Um, and as soon as she left music school, she went to med school. She decided to take a left turn and become a doctor. And we stayed friends ever since. And she, I knew that she was working in the ICU at the Allen Pavilion, which is part of the New York Presbyterian hospital system. So we were talking one night and she was, I, I was actually playing some Bach that I was learning. Um, I never learned the fifth cello suite and I just wanted to run through it before a concert that I was giving. And, and we, we were both talking about how we wished that this could reach the patients. And I think it both clicked in our heads at the same time. It's like, this is possible. Um, and so she ran it up her chain of command and we found the devices at the, the hospital to do it. And so ever since then, the, the medical staff have been placing iPod, iPad, sorry, iPads, smart devices with the patients. Um, we've developed an on-call system for our musicians so that they can be ready at a moment's notice to give these concerts when it's possible because the last thing we want to do is put an extra burden on the medical staff and all of this. Um, but it's what started at New York Presbyterian and was actually discovered by the New York Times. Um, you know, we didn't send out any press releases. They just happened to be there and heard about these programs. Um, as soon as that article came out, then we were flooded with um, requests from musicians who wanted to get involved, from hospitals who wanted to get involved. Um, Molly had contacts at the Juilliard School and we're working with their enrichment class to um, teach their students how to uh, start and manage a system like, like ours. Um, and we're, we're now up to a dozen hospitals. Um, yeah, I think we're gonna be servicing third, 30 concerts this week, and it's only growing um, each each week. So it's it's really taken on a life of its own, and we're um, yeah we're just thrilled to to be connecting with so many people who we've known in various um, parts of our lives who are who are really excited to have a purpose in this in this time. It, that's again just hearing about it. It's very moving. And I, I, when I read the article, one of the first things I thought was you know, I do a bit of work with an organization called Music for Food, which um, you know, where musicians play concerts to raise money to fight hunger. And the, the group's motto is, uh, we consider both music and food to be essential for human life and growth. And I was thinking about it in this context because, I mean, of course, people with this awful disease, first of all, they need medical care. They need for their physicians and um, medical practitioners to have protective equipment. They need a hospital bed. They need ventilators. But also while they're, you know, 
isolated from their families wh while in you know the the gravest medical condition they need beauty and they need something to feed their souls and i you know it made me think you know how music is essential and musicians are in a sense also essential workers through this time um are there any particular uh stories or experiences that you've had uh, with COVID patients or with or with people who are taking care of them that have made a particular impact on either of you? Molly, do you want to? Yeah, actually, I would say, you know, as, as musicians, we kind of throw around this phrase, the power of music um, a lot. And, and we say it so much that we forget what it actually means. And um, I think through this experience, being able to play into a, a void, play into a phone that's a black screen, but on the other side, hear the machines that are breathing for these humans on the other side, actually react to the music that we're playing. Has been like, uh, just, yeah, it's just put meaning back into that phrase to understand that, wow, this phrase in Brahms that makes my heart go, you know that my breath quickens and 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 my heart you know pushes out of my chest that it's it's real because I mean the machines are, are reacting on the other side there we hear it speeding up and slowing down um matching the music that we're playing so this is this has been um really remarkable yeah there's one you you touched on this Jonathan um the fact that these patients are isolated from their friends and family that's that's something that that I knew when we started this program. But what I didn't also realize was that these these patients are also isolated from their medical staff. Um, in in the hospital, the the doctors are only supposed to go in when it's absolutely medical ne medically necessary, and they get in and they get out. And that's been something that we had to work around developing the system where they can get get the 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 phone with the musician in and out as quickly as possible. But um, to, to feel like even even your medical staff member is feeling threatened by you like I the the community that that these musicians are able to bring safely into the room to remind a patient that there are people who out there who are not scared of them who want them to get better who want things to go back to normal um, with them it's I think that's that's almost important as important as the, the notes of the music itself um so yeah. yeah this this notion of creating this community through music is is one that we take very seriously yeah we've been we've been asked a lot um in the past week in various interviews um well, why don't you just put a radio next to the patient's bed wouldn't that wouldn't that help i mean what if the sound quality is actually even better on the radio than over mm -hmm. the phone? and so so yeah, we have thought about this, but I think to Andrew's point that there's a human on the other side of the phone. And when someone is so much in isolation that even the doctors can't be there in the same room with them, I think that's a, that makes a huge impact. I know if I were in that position, I would appreciate it. I, I would want someone on the other side of the phone rather than just the radio. So yeah, I think all of us who love music have had these moments of feeling that music makes us feel less alone. And I think what you're doing right now is 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 making that truer than maybe it's ever been. I, I really, I, yeah, I, again, I, I keep using the same word over and over, but I'm so moved hearing this story. And it's it's so obvious that the difference that you're making in the lives of, of, of people who are in a desperate situation and a terribly isolated one is, is profound. And um, I really want to just thank you for that. And, and also thank you for talking to me and demonstrating just how vital music and musicians and connecting through music is at all times and especially at this time. Um, it's, it's, uh, I think it's an incredibly powerful message. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. It's, it's great to talk with you again. It's great to see you again. You too. Thank you.
Thank you for watching. Thank you for your generosity. This concert will remain available uh, in case you know of anyone who wasn't able to watch but might still want to, and it will remain possible to donate. Uh, so once again, my thanks to you. I wish you all well, and to end the evening, just a bit more Schumann.